figure in the bioinformatics community for many years, who's most notably most known for the Protein Data Bank and being a previous president of ISCB. Um, he's been a professor at UC San Diego for many years, and then he started the NIH Data Initiative, and he is now the chair of data science at the University of Virginia. Phil has also been a very strong supporter of the Student Council ever since it began by helping us publish papers in PlosComp Bio by removing the fee and publishing lots of papers with the 10 simple rules with many of the student council members. We'd also like to thank him for stepping in at such short notice and being very helpful for us. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to need some help to get this thing running off the bat here, I guess. I don't want to pull this one out, so. Can you see, I can't see without my glasses. dialog box is it talking about? Yeah. Uh, oops. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Um, as uh, Eli said, I stepped in at the last minute to do this, unfortunately, because Debbie Marks couldn't be here. Uh, I decided particularly as Eli was speaking already about some of the work we're doing in deep learning. But I wouldn't uh, actually focus on, a, on research at all, but I would focus on what Eli also mentioned, which is a bit about professional development. Uh, because as I was, and I thought about this again as I was sitting there listening to Eli, that uh, I would have been giving that talk, it must have been like 40 years ago. So the, maybe I can tell you something that I've learned in 40 years that might be useful for you going forward. So that's what I'm going to try and do uh, in the next few minutes. And it's sort of a bit historic, or a bit, to put it in context, this is not a lecture. Uh, it's a little awkward in this environment as you're recording it, but it's supposed to be a discussion. Uh, I don't actually like giving lectures anymore because I think you could go and listen to a talking head anytime. It's much better to have some kind of interaction uh, either with yourselves or with the speaker and yourselves uh, that could be useful. So if there's anything I'm saying as I go along that you disagree with uh, or you want to comment on or whatever you want to do, just yell out and I'll repeat it as best I can and we'll, we'll try and have a bit of a dialogue. So we're approaching, uh, how many of you here have actually read any of the 10 simple rules? Oh, quite a few of you, okay. so. We're now approaching uh, the thousandth rule, which means there's been 100 articles. And just to give you a little historical perspective, this, this began uh, in 2005 at ISMB in Detroit. And so it's sort of like coming here, is the student council that actually asked me to, well maybe it was even a precursor to the student council, asked me to come and talk about getting published because we just formed the journal PLOS Computational Biology and I was the editor-in-chief. So I'm going over on the plane and as usual making my slides, so there's a lesson in that by the way. Um, and uh, I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to say? And I, I jotted down a few things and then I got there and I was expecting about 20 people and there was actually about 250 people sitting in the room. Some of them weren't that young actually, they were some quite old people as well. And we had the most amazing dialogue for like, it was supposed to go on for an hour, it went on for two and a half hours. Um, and so many good ideas and thoughts and things came up. I was going back on the plane and I thought, I really should try and encapsulate this in some way. And so I wrote 10 simple rules for getting published, which was the very first thing in the series. And now there's been, as you see, 99 or close to 99 uh, other articles. And uh, what's really important all about this, which takes us to rule one and two, uh, or take home messages one and two about what I'm gonna tell you, uh, is that this has very little to do with me. It started with me, but it actually, it, what's the, the richness of the whole thing is that many other people have contributed to this series to make it uh, actually useful. And it's a, the real lesson in all of this is of course that it's a team sport. So what you're doing now is a team sport. 
And I can tell you uh, through experience of 40 years or more that however smart you are, you're only going to really succeed in this business if you're a team player and you know how to build and lead a team. And that's a skill set that frankly you're not going to get from most of what, what you actually learn automatically. You're going to have to uh, really go out of your way to, to work on that. And it's going to be really important. Of course, I couldn't actually uh, say anything about team sport without putting up England's win from uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and Brazil, by the way, if you're interested, Brazil are just coming back right now as I was, uh, as I was looking a moment ago. And not that I wasn't listening to Eli, but anyway, there you go. Um, all right, so that's take home one is that this is about teaming. But take home two really is about, it's more than just being able to build and support and be part of a team. It sort of speaks to a number of other things as well, all of which you really learn very little about. Uh, I was struck by this when I actually wrote down one day, sitting in my office as a professor in a university, what it was I did that day. 90% of it I had absolutely zero training in whatsoever. And th those were the things that I was actually doing. Uh, so this relates to your ability to communicate both verbally and in writing, your administrative ability, uh, and they all impact the productivity because as you get measured, and I'm speaking primarily about academia, but it applies uh, across the board in industry as well and other places in government, is you're going to be measured by your papers, which in turn are related to grants uh, because you need money to do this work. We'll say more about that in a minute. You're also going to be measured on how well you teach, so teaching awards, uh, editorial and committee work, and other kinds of contributions. So it's great you're all part of this organisation. That counts for something already. You need to really build on all of that going forward. So what I'm saying here really is take home two is it's, it's all about being a package. And maybe that's not very apparent to you right now because you're struggling as you move forward just trying to get your research done and either get your, if your postdocs are ready, you've already moved on, but if you're trying to get that degree. And I appreciate it's not easy to necessarily think about these things, but I think the earlier you think about them, the better your career is going to go. That's just my two cents. So uh, the other part of it is as you move forward, and this is something that struck me, I was working in a lab in my PhD where I actually thought at some point I'm not actually doing the most interesting work going. This led to a number of conflicts between my PI and myself, I have to say. But in the end, I think uh, we came to a sort of compromise and it moved the lab in a little different direction uh, and it certainly moved me in a different direction. So I think it's really important that you work on the important problems. Uh, Hamming said this. Who knows what the Hamming distance is? Okay, most of you, that's good. Uh, so uh, he actually gave a very interesting lab, uh, uh, he was at Bell Labs, he gave a very interesting lab lecture and this is captured in one of the 10 Simples Rules. But you need to work on important problems. So the, then of course the question becomes, well how do I decide really what the important problems are? Uh, and then how do I get involved with them? Well I think in some level w where things are headed is something that again when you're in that, and you're sitting in front of your terminal every day, you don't necessarily think about this, but I think you need, even now, to take a much broader perspective. So, uh, I mean, I think where you can, if you think, want to think about where everything's going, you can think about it from where we've come. And so this is something I actually presented to, uh, for a while I was the chief data scientist for the National Institutes of Health here in the US, and I reported to the director of NIH, Francis Collins, and I was sort of, all things data, I suppose. And I gave a presentation to the advisory group that really oversees the NIH uh, about how things are evolving. And I think I'm just going to go over this quickly because I think it's sort of how, how things have, have evolved really says something about where they're going. So when you think about computational biology and biomedicine as a discipline, uh, you think about it in terms of how it's evolved. Before the 80s, there was really nothing. Those of us who were actually doing any of this stuff uh, were sort of like these outliers in a sitting in the corner. And then I think what really kicked things off was when we had the Human Genome Project. Because what happened then is that they wouldn't let that project go forward without there being folks who could actually manage the large amounts of information, large in those times, that were coming out of those projects. 
And it was the very first time I saw synergy between experiment and computation. So what happened is we were working on physical and genetic mapping, and in fact, the algorithms we developed to do the assembly actually were used to actually drive better experiments. So there was this virtuous cycle going on that proved to be enormously valuable. And this was about uh, 93 or thereabouts. And at that point, I said to myself, this is the future. And so I would try and think for yourselves, what is the future? And how do I want to be part of that future if I'm going to get the best out of the most out of my career? Then what happened is because of the nature of the way things work, in some senses, it, bioinformatics at that time was oversold. Industry scooped up about half of the few people doing it. And of course, industry works on pretty short life cycles and timelines. So when there was not the productivity in three to five years that they were expecting out of bioinformatics, those people started getting fired. And most of them drifted back to academia. And when they drift, and then we went through this period where bioinformatics sort of became a service. And then it started to gain momentum because no lab could really do without some computational expertise. And of course, all of this was driven by some outside influences, which I'll say something about in a minute. And so then we became partners in the enterprise. And what's really amazing now to me is we are the drivers of the enterprise. I, I'm absolutely convinced that virtually all biology and biomedicine is, driven, is going to be driven by what you in this room are doing. Don't get too heady. Uh, so the raw material, this of course is driven in part by the raw material. So initially we didn't have that much digital data, then we had more and we had ontologies started to evolve and structured data started to evolve. Then we ended up getting to the point of so-called big data, uh, and that, which of course was sort of siloed. Now we're moving into no SQL and, and unstructured and more integrated and open data, which actually opens up a completely different world. I think this is going to be, in my thinking, and now I'm driven very much by what I'm doing in data science, so I have a certain, I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid here, so you have to take what I'm saying with a pinch of salt, but this is the way I see it. And then how we, how we were identified, I think, is changing. We are now recognized as a field of academics. You can get tenure as a computational biologist, uh, and you can certainly do very well as a data scientist. So, but as all this has happened, in, and so in some ways, this sort of old hat to computational biologists, this current data revolution, but really what's happening is it's creating new opportunities for all of you. That's the good news. The bad news is it's also creating new opportunities. And when I was at the NIH, we were very, and I'm sorry that's a little US-centric, I, I appreciate it as an international audience, it's just that's where I come from, so bear with me, is we became very, and are very concerned that the likes of you are going to drift off into other fields. And so there's really, I think, the, the effort to keep you here is something that's getting quite a lot of attention. But it's kind of understanding why it's happened, because uh, who knows, you can probably read it anyway, but do you, who recognizes that guy on the top right? Anyone? It, his name's Jim Gray. Does anybody know what Jim Gray does? Did? <laughs> <laughs> no, really? <laughs> Uh, you get a prize afterwards. Uh, so yes, he was a data scientist. He was actually a Turing Prize winner, which, is, as you probably know, is the equivalent of sort of the Nobel Prize in the computer science world. He, he also worked for Microsoft, but hey, no, the world's not a perfect place. Um, but he actually also disappeared. It was just an interesting, this is totally an aside, this is a you know, little antidote on the side, is when he disappeared, he was out on his boat, he sailed off out of California somewhere on his sailing boat, and he completely disappeared. And a whole bunch of data scientists got together looking at satellite imagery, trying to find his boat by doing, and they failed. Eli would have succeeded. I mean, you know, but I mean, I think everything's more data, more algorithms, and so on now. But anyway, that's what happened. But he coined this notion of the fourth paradigm. And you can see what the other paradigms are there. The first paradigm is just doing empirical science in what you actually see. Uh, the second was in sort of model-based theoretical science. Then came computational science in the 50s and 60s, and now we're in this data-driven world, which is really quite amazing. Um, and why I'm worried is because this is, this is taken from our own work at uh, the Data Science Institute I run at the University of Virginia. 
So this is just all the companies and where people have ended up. And you probably can't, I, frankly, I couldn't read hardly any of the, the slides from like halfway back. I don't know anyone can read them from the back. But anyway, the point is that, uh, and all these are on slides share, so you can look at them later. But the point is there are lots and lots of really good opportunities out there. This is, these are folks who are going out after 11 month master's program and doing very well. And so what worries me is what happens to those who want to do postdocs on a fraction of these salaries uh, and then going to a, a tight funding environment when there's lots of really interesting stuff going on all over the place that pays a lot better. Uh, so it's a little worrying. But hopefully things will, will balance out. Let's look at this in another way. So this again, we're on this idea that, of trying to predict what is going to happen in the future so you can think about where you should be in your career. It's like getting ahead of the curve. All right? And I really like this uh, notion of what's happening. This is something I also presented to the advisory board at NIH. And it's what's called the six Ds, and it comes from uh, Peter Diamantis. And essentially the six Ds you can see there, uh, the first step is digitization, and then we go through these other phases. And I'm going to illustrate them uh, in the context of an example uh, so that you can see what happens over time. So when we digitize content, we go, it, so now you could say, in fact this is even more than true, that it's a, we're in an exponential growth phase, right? So when you go into this exponential growth phase, the first phase of it is deception because you don't actually appreciate how fast things are growing and how they're changing. And a good way to illustrate this was with photography and what happened uh, in that revolution. So as we digitized, Kodak invented the digital camera and they put it on a shelf because they didn't think, they thought it would interfere with their chemical business. That was the biggest mistake any just about any company's ever made. Because when they saw cameras emerging with more pixels, more photographs, digital photographs coming along, they didn't see it as a threat because it was still very low down on this digital, on this uh, exponential curve. Then we hit this inflection point which creates disruption. It was at that point that uh, digi uh, Kodak went bankrupt essentially. And then some other really interesting things in my, in my way of thinking happened. Beyond disruption, we started to see demonetization. So suddenly photographs, digital photographs, weren't actually worth anything anymore. There was no cost in producing them, essentially. And so that would demonetize what the prior businesses were. They also dematerialized. There was no material involved in this, except a few bits. And it also democratized everything. So what we ended up with in all of this was something that was absolutely completely different. That Instagram is probably valued now more than Kodak ever was, and it has nothing to do with digital photographs. It has to do with communicating in a completely different way. What's this got to do with you? If, this start, if you imagine that this is starting to happen across the biomedical enterprise, you know, the question is, where are we in that curve? Are we all par already past the inflection point, or are we getting close to it, or we know we're near it? My sense is we're probably, we're close to that inflection point. And I think you're going to see uh, much, the, the emergence of this and potential quite, quite a, a set of disruptions. For you, if I was at your stage in your careers, I'd be thinking about how I'm going to maximize my career against those disruptions, whatever that means. And I'd be happy to uh, talk to you about all of this, of course, offline. So if you imagine, so just sort of relating that more to our own world, what does all this mean? Well, imaging, we're actually seeing the cost of imaging, full body MRIs, all of this is coming down. We already heard from Eli about machine learning has been pretty successful in 2D image analysis. We're going to see amazing advances. We see some of this in the gaming industry, uh, both in 2D and 3D. Uh, it's going to change what we can do with imagery and how we can interpret it and how it gets automatically interpreted. That has a huge impact on biomedical research and healthcare. Electronic health records are still the wild, wild west. We've only had them effectively for a few years. We're still in positions of... How many of you are working with electronic health records here? No one. Okay. Uh, there's a certain bias in this meeting, which I'd be happy to talk to you about offline, but <clears throat> let's not go there. I'll get in trouble. 
Um, I'm here. Um, this, this is clearly, from the point of view of phenotype, uh, uncharted territory. We're already seeing some very interesting predictive modeling from EHRs. This is only, from electronic health records, this is only going to increase. Tying this much more to genotype, which is what many of you appear to be working on, then I think you know, there's huge uh, possibilities here. There's also integration with other data types which have profound implications, particularly environmental data. The role of, 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 of how our environment affects cancers, autism, all of these things are completely open questions. And we're starting to get more and more data, particularly from things like sensors with air quality and all this sort of thing, that really can be applied and integrated into our thinking. It's really quite something quite different. Social media data is just noisy, unstructured, but incredibly interesting with respect to what you can define, derive from it. And it's to some degree accessible. Um, there's lots of stories about Donald Trump here, but let's not go into that. But uh, for example, mental health can be, there are a lot of work being done in, in determining one's mental health by actually analyzing uh, Twitter streams and Facebook posts and a million other things. And then just another one, global health, pandemics. Some of you may have, this is closer to what goes on right now, but just the level of complexity across very large data sets uh, offers enormous opportunities. So that's sort of, you know, I think uh, examples of where you could start looking uh, for ideas for how you apply what you already learned to what you might do in the future. So think about, no one's yelling out with any kind of commentary here. I, you know, don't, don't, don't be shy, you know, don't be shy. This is, Eli will tell you, I'm, not, I'm a friendly sort of person. You can say anything you want. Uh, there's also the notion of technologies and how that drives change. Obviously, many of you are sitting here because of the way sequencing is, uh, the technologies associated with sequencing have changed over the last 10, 20 years. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Just to give you one example that I've been toying with in various forms for several years now is that we wrote an article not that long ago which basically asked the question, will biomedical research become more like Airbnb? And the, the first reaction is, what on earth could he possibly be talking about? But if you think about it, what is Airbnb? How many of you are, uh, are staying in an Airbnb now? A few of you. How many of you have been hosts on Airbnb? <laughs> okay. So essentially, you're on either side of a provision, so you're a supplier or you're a consumer in an Airbnb environment, all right? It's true of Uber, Lyft, whatever you want to say. And what's the brilliant thing about it is that in the middle, there's a plant platform that handles all of those transactions. Uh, in a, in, you know, I wish I'd thought of it because it's, you know, it's, it's to take a small slice of profit of, of really a few people in a room writing software is pretty cool. Um, I mean, there's obviously lots of ramifications and ethical questions around all of this, but that's what it is. It's a relationship between a supplier and a consumer that's based on trust. Can you begin to see how that relates to you? No. All right, I'll tell you. Essentially what it means is you are a supplier and you're a consumer. Hopefully you're writing scientific papers as a supplier. You're reading them as a consumer. So there's that and there's a level of trust that goes on. You trust the authors that wrote the papers, you trust the reviewers, you trust the journal that publishes it and so that is it. And it exists on a platform. A bloody awful platform typically and they're, these things, anyway it's another story. But that's, but that is just one segment of the whole enterprise of what we do. If you think about the research life cycle going down this, and you can't read this because it's washed out, but on one level you've got how you have ideas and how those ideas get projected into grants. There's a supply and there's a demand for those ideas. You go down the list, you produce data. You're the, you're the producer, the supplier. That's consumed by people who go to the databases. So, and the, the database is trusted, all right? So you've got, the problem is you've got these layers, but they don't interoperate with each other. So it makes the whole enterprise extremely inefficient. So the idea that you start moving towards a situation on a platform where data, analytics, uh, ideas, narrative, 
final publications, which are really in some ways advertisements for the data and the analytics and the methods, all exist in the same platform where in principle when you compute, you analyze and you work on that, whatever you, the output is also remains in the platform and is available to other people. So we're a long way, this, the whole notion of the commons, if you're interested in stuff or involved in it, there's a session tomorrow on big data to knowledge, there was a program that was put together that sort of exemplifies trying to do this kind of thing. It, we're a long way from being there, but in my opinion it's where things are headed. So I think thinking about how those technologies are going to affect what you do and how you think about your future careers is something else I wanted to say. Take home four. That's the most compelling science, now we've established how you might begin to think about that, still needs money. This is not something you think about now. You get your monthly stipend, you're happy, you know, and then you look in your, your mentor's office and he or she is completely consumed with writing more grants to try and support what you're doing. It's, you know, it's a, it's a hard system and uh, it needs money and they're raising the money. But very soon, in some way or another, and the sooner you start, the better off you're going to be. If you have your own fellowship, if you're interested in coming to my lab, you have your own fellowship. You've got a foot in the door already because you've just made my life a lot easier. So don't think it's not important to be thinking about money right now. Money, I hate to say it, we can be as uh, egotic, not egotic, we can be as uh, uh, puritanical as we want, but ultimately the system is driven by money. And so it, applies, it, it, it pays to look at what uh, is the kinds of things are being funded and think about how that fits into what you want to do in the future and how it, thinks to, how it fits into where the science is going. So I'm just going to, I just want to highlight this uh, because this sort of illustrates that. And again, I apologize for it being US centric, but that's, I was in a, the, the, you know, a funding agency in the US, so I can't help that. But about a month after I went to the NIH, about four or five years ago, Francis Collins came to me and he said, I want you to write a brief that's the intersection of big data, genomics, and precision medicine. And I said, okay, I'm do that. Uh, what's it for? He said, it's for the president. And I said, the president of what? And he, he said, POTUS. I thought POTUS was some society. It was only when I went and looked it up when I got back to my office that it's the president of the United States. So we developed um, this brief that was for precision medicine. And this is actually, I, unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to go to the meeting, but this is the meeting when it was presented to President Obama. So, and I, I have a reason for doing this, it's a political statement, okay? So, in this room is the President, obviously. There's the closest, on the right-hand side is John Holdren, who was the National Science Advisor. Next to him is Francis Collins, the Director of NIH. And then you go around the left-hand side, you might recognize some of you, Eric Lander, who was the chair of PCAS, which was the President's Committee on Advanced Science and Technology. And then you have Sylvia Burwell, who was the head of Health and Human Services. Okay? And then there's some other distinguished people in the back, including the head of the DOE and so on. Virtually none of those people exist anymore. Okay? There is only one person deciding the scientific fate of our country, and obviously that has significant impact elsewhere. This is very scary, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? That's a political statement. Backing off from that, there was just one example of a series of high-profile funded projects. So precision medicine now is embodied in something called the All of Us program. So it's actually getting together a cohort of one million people with everything from genotype to phenotype. Okay? And so uh, that's one of these projects. There are others that uh, are get high profile. So again, it's worth, even if it's not about, if you're from another country, these kinds of things are going on in other countries as well. So it's trying to think about how you can leverage these developments as you think about the forward trajectory of your careers. So just to uh, give uh, examples, the Moonshot is the Cancer Genomics Project, uh, built around TCJ, and, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and a number of other things. The MODS is, is, is around the model organism databases and how those evolved as independent entities around model organism organisms, but now it makes more sense in trying to put all that together into one system. Uh, the human microbiome is a sort of a gut feel project. Obviously, that has 
uh, huge health-based implications. TopMed is really just a huge conglomerate of data that has all sorts of things, everything from genotype to phenotype, imaging, proteomics, metabolomics, everything in between, uh, and how to, how to handle and deal with that data and what can you get out of it, what can you learn from it, how can you make rational decisions that affect healthcare based around it. ECHO is about the environment and child health. Again, these are, these are important developments. So these are, these are leading edge projects within a leading funding agency. And so how you think about them are important. And of course, the brain project uh, in neuroscience is uh, you know, uh, obviously a whole, the whole area of neuroscience, which frankly is completely underrepresented at this conference. Uh, how you can have an, inst a, an international society of computational biology, and we have as little neuroscience in it as we have, it blows my mind. Okay. Anyway, that's another political statement of sorts. Uh, so let's, let's turn away from uh, effectively where you should think about your science should go to think about some more philosophical things and some more personal things just to end off with. So the take home five is to treat others as you treat yourself. Does anybody recognize this guy at the bottom? Okay, so that's, his name's Jason Packen. He's... Um, he, he was a graduate student with Bernard Polson, who was at U, uh, University of California, San Diego, which is where I was. He did, he did a joint project uh, in my lab. He did a rotation in my lab, but he was primarily Bernard's student. But we did, we did a fair bit of work together, okay? So the point was that some 30 years later, he was on the search committee as a full professor at University of Virginia uh, when I was actually applying to go in, uh, to the University of Virginia. So if I how shall I put it politely, pissed him off when I was a graduate student, when he was a graduate student, I'm sure I wouldn't have got a job. Um, you know, so it's, the point is what goes around comes around. And you're in a community that's really small and close-knit and likes to gossip like every other community. And so words travel. So you're building a, believe, you, probably, you don't even think about it at this point, but you're building a reputation now. And that's going to carry forward and it's going to compound for all of your career. So what steps you take and how you treat other people um, is really going to count for a lot. So I, sorry, I told you it was going to be philosophical. Uh, take home six. Follow your heart, not your brain. Okay? I've, I've, been, I've been involved with many, many students. I've had about 150 people go through my lab over the years. And I can't tell you how many times I have situations where students come to you uh, grappling with what it is that they sh should do and what they, what, they want, what they think they want to do and what they should do. An example would be a student comes in who, who really likes soft, developing software, software engineering, whatever it might be, but they also see that's where their passion is, but they also see to su succeed in the business they're in, in academia, it's not so much about the software, regrettably, at this stage. It's more about getting those leading edge papers out there. But they're less interested in that than they are in working in a software environment and working with other software developers and doing all that. So their passion, their heart, is in one place, but their head is telling them something else. And my view would be is they, and I've seen it many times, they will not succeed to the, 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 the the maximum of their ability if they actually follow their head instead of their heart. So I think it's definitely something to think about uh, at any time point in your career. Uh, I could give you lots of examples from my own uh, winding path to illustrate that, but I don't want to bore you any more than I am already. Uh, okay, take home seven. We're almost done with this. Uh, diversity of research is a relative term and figure out where you're comfortable on the spectrum. So you can, in your research, and now of course, it's, you're kind of mainly in a, in a drilling down as you do, as, but the question is, you know, how comfortable are you doing that going forward? How broad do you want to be or how narrow? More diversity means less depth, however smart you are. And I think it, it behoves you to think about being really honest with yourself and where you exist on that spectrum. And where, because that's what you should strive to be. Don't try and be something that you're not. 
And, uh, you know, for me, at this point, uh, I'm much more comfortable do doing a lot of things poorly than I am doing a, f a couple of things deeply and hopefully well. But that's just me. You have to find out where you are for yourself. So take home eight, uh, it's about balance. So, oh, that's weird. I don't know why these pictures didn't, the picture didn't come up. That's, oh, that's very strange. Anyway, um, these are pictures, a couple of pictures of my family. My daughter's here actually working in the, in the uh, helping in the, the ICB folks. But uh, you know, we've been to many ICBs. It's a wonderful community. Um, but it's a little story around all of this. It's about your balance in your life. And I, I say this all the time, and I'm not very good at it, so I don't actually practice what I preach. But I'll just tell you a little story. I just told the graduating class of, of master students that we in data science that we graduated last year. It's, my kids are like 12 years apart. When my son was little, he's now 32, and he works for Industrial Light and Magic, uh, making movies and stuff. When he was little, he would sit on my lap. When he talked to me, he would hold my face and look into my eyes. And I thought, oh, that's really endearing. And then 12 years later, my daughter, who was sitting in the back of the room a little while ago, who was so bored, left. Uh, she, 12 years later, she came along, and she's doing the same thing, sitting on my lap, holding my face, looking in my eyes. I thought, oh, it must be a genetic trait. <laughs> then one day, I realized the true nature of the business <laughs> is they would come running up to me, Dad, Dad, help me with this, help me with this. And I'd be looking at the computer screen going, uh-huh, 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 <laughs> ignoring them. And so that, this was their way of getting my attention. It was like the most devastating moment in, I, I can possibly imagine. And even now, they're 21 and 32, and I say to them, does it really affect you? Did it really affect you? They say, no, nah, Dad, it was great. We had a great childhood. Yeah, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I, I, I worry about it still. Anyway, so you know, it's all about balance, um, whatever your interests are. And I think, ultimately, you do the best work by having a lot of interests that have nothing to do with that work. If you come back to it refreshed and you really can dig in. All right, so, we was, I don't know how much time we have, if any. Uh, I'm around, actually, because my daughter's here, I'm actually around for the whole conference, which is very unusual. Uh, so if you're here, I'd be happy to just catch me. I'd be happy to talk about any of this with you at any time. But if uh, my questions really for now are, does what I, any of I, what I said resonate with you? Particularly, I'm interested in what is missing from your perspective because we're on the verge of having the 10 meta rules, okay? I have eight. If you help me with two more that I haven't thought of or, a, or, or better ones than I've already thought of, I could steal your ideas and publish another 10 simple rules and, you know, <laughs> be even more infamous or whatever. Um, so what, I'm, I'm joking, of course. Uh, I'll be happy to co-author it with you. Uh, what is missing from your perspective? And then also, what could ISCB do to help that it's not doing uh, in this context of professional development? You are a very vibrant part of this organization. Uh, each year when I sit through those uh, generally boring uh, ISCB council meetings, uh, the student body presentations are always, by, always the most interesting, I think. So anyway, that's, uh, that's really all I wanted to say. And I really would be interested in having some thoughts from you. Thank you very much. Anyone willing to say anything? Okay, let me, so, the, the, you know, yeah, how, how, how does luck play into your career? So let me just answer that with another little story to start with, all right? So the thing I love about this 10 Simple Rules business is stuff comes out of the woodwork. Two Australian uh, students wrote one, which was a, a while back, not that long ago, that essentially was, it was 10 Simple Rules for writing 10 Simple Rules. And I thought, this, I, I, it's not often you read a manuscript and you laugh out loud, I've got to tell you, at least not for the right reasons. Um, 
So that was, so, and I thought, wow, and they, a couple of the ideas they had, they had some great ideas in there. And one of the, you know, so one of the points was you've got to have something worth writing about. And they made a couple of good suggestions. One was 10 simple rules for writing and no, winning a Nobel Prize. So I thought, okay, that's good. So I went to Rich Roberts, who's a Nobel laureate, and I said, Rich, will you, will you write an article about this? And his response was, Phil, you really, I'll say it again, piss me off. I don't want to write, I don't want to encourage that. And I said, Rich, you're only saying that because you have a Nobel Prize. Right? <laughs> but he said, no, I, we shouldn't be encouraging the idea that it's all about these prizes. Anyway, I said, OK, well, write an article about that that says it's not that important. It's more what you do every day kind of thing. And he did a, he did a very nice article. It's there. It's got lots of downloads and views and what have you. Anyway, part of the point in all of that was that luck pays a factor. And there's, no, there's nothing about, but you can make luck. And luck doesn't come without hard work. So it's, you know, there's, and, and it's, ha it's also your attitude. You mentioned grants. You know, when money's really tight, and it's tight now, it's not as tight as it was a year or two ago, but it's tight, then luck become, it becomes a crapshoot to get a grant in some ways. And, you know, luck definitely plays into that. Or, you know, in the same way, if luck plays in, if you get, you know, you have three reviews on a paper and it just so happens they like or dislike the work, that's, you know, that's luck as well. Your response to that should always be to keep trying, work harder. If it doesn't go in, put it, figure out, take every essence of the points that they've made and re-put it in and work hard to make it happen. That, you will make your own luck. Sorry, that was a bit of a, that was a bit of a... <laughs> soapboxy thing there. Um, anything else? Other thoughts? Yeah. So, I don't know if this is in the 10 simple rules I read this, or just somebody saying it about Nobel Prize awards and I said, but you see, when Nobel Prize winners <coughs> cite the important papers of their discoveries, it's not usually in large journals that those initial important papers were in. It's in these kind of small medley journals, which then begs the question, when you're reading like papers out of CNN, so cell groups of science, versus like, should you focus Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that, you know, I'm, and I'm a little biased in my thinking about this because, you know, obviously people strive like crazy to get into one word journals, science and nature and cell. But they also have a particularly high level of retractions. They also, you know, they also go after the, the really, uh, you know, hot, so called, from their point of view, hot stuff. And I think you really have to, and it's hard when you're just learning. But it, you've, as best you can, you have to make your own judgments. And in my view, those judgments cut across not just leading journals, but they cut across many other things, including not necessarily f formal journal content itself. It could be written in someone's blog. It could be, you know, it's, 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 and that's tough because that's a lot of material to cover. But uh, my personal view is, and this is time and time again, there are, you know, very famous. Uh, pieces of science that have appeared that were rejected from multiple journals uh, and ended up in you know in so-called low-tier journals. As best you can, you have to. I don't think there is. Uh, you're going to find good stuff all over the place, and you're going to find bad stuff even more all over the place. So as best you can, you have to make uh, your own your own judgments about it. It does beg something I'm actually talking about in a couple of days, which is the whole relates to this sort of platform ideas where. You should be in a position to really test, not take what's in a paper on face value, but you should have the analytics, you should have the data, it should be in a Jupyter notebook, whatever. You should be able to actually play around with this and run it yourself and make your own judgments across the spectrum of content that's much more than what someone says in a paper. You know, uh, Eli just said that his, met <laughs> his method was going to be better than other methods. Well, Matt, I'm hoping he's right, but you know, you should be in a position to actually be able to test that and, and determine that for yourself in a, in a way that's not you know, overly onerous, which is what the case is now. It's almost impossible now to actually uh, you know, make that, that statement. But you know, that's all about reproducibility, and that's really another subject. So I kind of waffled, but uh, I really do think you have to look all over the place. Anything else? Yeah.
Yeah, this is a deep uh, philosophical question that's, you know, I, I guess a lot of in the machine learning community and, uh, and in the, the more traditional communities, if you like, are sort of thinking about and, oh, I'm sorry. So this is really about uh, the, if the influence of thing in machine learning and how that uh, relates to the more causal types of science where you're looking for causality. In these cases, you, don't know, you get an outcome that seems to be correct, but you have no idea how it, how it uh, arose. I think that's the essence of your question, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that is a, a leading question, but I, you know, I think the, the issue right now is a lot of this machine learning stuff in many ways is oversold. It's clearly very powerful in a number of ways, but in the end, uh, you know, as I teach and, and are involved in, mach in machine learning across disciplines much broader than biomedicine, what I realize more and more is the best outcomes going forward are going to be how these methodologies are applied in concert with experts who really understand the data. So, yeah, there are, there are these cases where no one knows, you know, and there's a lot of data you don't know what to do with. So you, you take a huge amount of a Twitter stream, right? You can do things with that. It's unstructured. You don't know necessarily what you're looking for, and some interesting things can come out of it. But you know, most of what we do is not like that. The data is, is if, even if it's not structured, it has a context to it that has a lot of value that particularly only experts associated with that data understand. So I look at it more uh, as a partnership rather than any kind of threat, for example, going forward. Uh, but it is a different, in some cases where it works without really understanding what the interrelationships are and what features were actually uh, the most prominent in the learning, uh, yeah, it, it is a new, to some degree, a bit of a new, f a, a new paradigm. But you know, it's ultimately that's only going to be a small part of the answer. It's really going to be uh, what, wh how it's applied in the hands of uh, of experts, in my opinion. Anything else? Okay, well, I thank you for your attention. As I said, I'm around. I'd be happy to try and uh, answer any questions during the, the week if you have. Cheers. Very good. I'd like to give you a gift. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I, yeah, I'm just ashamed Debbie Marks wasn't here because I'd really like to hear what she was going to say, but she couldn't be helped.